Welcome to Coffee Commerce. My name is Sean Ramit, and I'm the grandson of a coffee farmer from Guyana, South America. On Coffee Commerce, we talk about the stories behind coffee as they relate to ideas, commerce, and society. Around 1780, we see the beginning of the decline of the British coffee houses. This would be the trend for the next 50 years. Some have said that it was because of the, of the success of the coffee houses and the amazing inventions, ideas, and industries that had come out of coffee houses, conversations, that we start to see the decline in them. Perhaps we should explore this in a bit more context to better understand. In our previous episode, we had discussed how much of the ideas around the Industrial Revolution were birthed in coffee houses and by coffee patrons. It was this Industrial Revolution that helped make Britain great. Wealth had increased. Demand for productivity, goods, services had boomed. Social patterns had shifted. And we see a migration to the cities and then further migration to areas around the cities of what we would now call suburbs. So the increased wealth and success of the Industrial Revolution meant another change in social patterns. In fact, this would have a pivotal impact even for the coffee houses. Some of the coffee houses started to become more of the exclusive clubs for the wealthy few. Perhaps the most elite of these clubs was the Athenaeum on Pall Mall, founded in 1824. A gentleman could only enter the premises by becoming a formal member of this club. This was a far cry from the origins of the British coffee houses that offered freedom for anyone to be patrons at a reasonable price. At the same time as the coffee houses were becoming more exclusive, the taverns or public houses started to flourish once again. With the growing working class moving into the cities, the stimulation of debate and ideas at a traditional coffee house was not what they sought. Instead, they were looking to relax and take their minds off of work. The atmosphere of the tavern or public house offered just that, along with ale. Coffee houses had also offered auxiliary services such as a place for the mail to arrive for patrons, a place to get the news and to conduct business. Around this time of industrial prosperity, special service providers began to find their niche. The postal system expanded delivery to include direct home mail. With mail now being directed to homes, other things would shift, including delivery of newspapers. Not only did the distribution of newspapers shift, but they started to produce on a more regular basis. With business flourishing, many, such as insurance companies, were wealthy enough now to build their own offices. Next, enter T. This would perhaps be the perfect timing for an alternative to coffee and the coffee houses. The British started to fall in love with tea. This was most certainly popular with the ladies. It was popular with the main British importer, the English's East India Company. This was no doubt a company of size and stature. Not to lose out on either market, the East Indian Company imported both coffee and tea for both beverage lovers. But they decided to, that selling tea was a more lucrative market. Just what was it about tea that made it more lucrative? The English could make tea at home. The process was simple. Boil water and add the tea leaves. Coffee was a much more technical process. This is why it was primarily offered at coffee houses who had the equipment and know-how to make the hot beverage. In fact, tea drinkers could be encouraged to drink tea more often than coffee drinkers would be able to drink their black beverage. Tea was also considered less controversial, perhaps because it, was, it could be made at and consumed at home by both men and women. It was not as harsh as coffee either. Plus the coffee houses being mostly for men only, consuming coffee became something that women would not support. In fact, they outright fought against it. 
where coffee was seen as a man's drink to be consumed in coffee houses, surrounded by debate, business, and scientific studies, tea was something that was perceived to bring the family together and socializing over friendly conversations. Wives enjoyed having their husbands at home. Tea also was not as much of a stimulant as coffee, so people enjoyed tea before bedtime. In 1717, in London, the first tea shop was opened by Twinings. It catered primarily to ladies of fashion. It allowed women to blend shopping and socializing over a cup of tea. Almost as quickly as they sprang up, the London coffee houses began to decline. This is what was written about this. They had served their purpose and were no longer needed as meeting places for politics or liter literary criticism and debate. They had seen the nation pass through one of its greatest periods of trials and tribulation, had fought and won the battle for individual freedom, had acted as a steady influence, and had given us a standard of prose written and literary criticism unequaled before or since. He had some other things in favor for it as well. Advances in transportation were continuous. Tea started out being a private luxury of the aristocrats due to, in part to the heavy taxation that had been placed on the beverage. Initially, tea was priced out of reach for most people. Then taxation decreased on tea, which made it affordable for most people. Different cultural shifts were seen with tea as well. Tea gardens popped up, which made them great gathering places for family and friends to meet. Coffee started to, meet, to have more and more things going against it. By the 1730s, coffee houses had become associated with political intrigue, male debauchery, and women being banned from them unless you were employed. Coffee could would never leave, but tea had some compelling influence, especially for families. Tea became the dominant drink in London and eventually all of Great Britain. The English coffee house reveled in success for approximately 175 years, but these were important years for England. The nation went through a transition that would make it stand out from the rest of Europe. It was instrumental in donning the age of innovation, thinking, debate, industry, rationality, and improved government. The coffee house was part of the changing social scene and even set the pace of change. By providing a forum for engaging in business, politics, and pleasure, it deserves recognition as a game changer in its own right. But let's not say goodbye to coffee. This is not the end, just the beginning. There's far more stories while we enjoy more cups of coffee. Thank you.